morning. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing very, very well. So, uh, my name is Gerald Anderson, and I'm a member of the uh, board of directors for the Fredericksburg Food Co-op. I've been a member since 2016, Earth Day 2016, I think. And I saw this is almost an anniversary for me. Um, so I've been on the board for, let's see, about five years now, almost. And uh, I'm the acting chair this year. Rich gave it up for change. So but it's been, it's been fun so far. But anyway, we have a great uh, event tonight. Dr. Eric Bonds from the University of Mary Washington is going to talk to us about plastics in our life and all the stuff about them. It's more than you probably ever wanted to know. Uh, Eric is the professor of sociology at the University of Mary Washington. He teaches classes on environmental sociology, human rights, and social theory. And he's also a founder and current steering, steering committee member for the Fossil Free Fredericksburg, which we are all familiar with. And before I hand it over to him, I want to give you a few instructions which will help in the long run. Uh, if up in the right-hand corner, if you go up to the right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see where there's a box up there that shows different ways that you can see the screen. If you choose the speaker view, it'll get rid of all these other squares and you'll just see the speaker picture. It'll make it a lot easier for you. If you have any questions at the bottom of the screen, I've, probably most of you are familiar with it, there's a chat box down there. And we welcome you to add any questions you have in that chat box down there. And I, we'll get to them later on. And we are going to be recording the session, which has already started. And it'll be available on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Eric Bonds, and he's going to talk to us about plastics. All right. Well, it's so wonderful to uh, be here with you all tonight, and I hope you had the opportunity, I'm sure you did, to, to watch the film, The Story of Plastics. It is from a, an organization that I also recommend. It's, uh, the organization is called The Story of Stuff. And if you haven't checked out their material on the web, I highly recommend that you do so. They have a lot of, a lot of great videos. They're short videos, just about 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes long on a number of different environmental uh, issues. And I really enjoy their perspective. And I'll go ahead. I have a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation here that the, uh, uh, the co-op asked me to, to put together. And so I'll just real briefly give just a very, just very short, very brief overview of the perspective offered in the film and then move on. And what, when I do so in this discussion, I wanna make clear that, you know, I do not claim any particular expertise in plastics or issues related to plastics. Um, what I hope that, you know, I can provide is a sociological perspective and a kind of an activist perspective as well that can maybe suggest, suggest some more helpful ways forward and what we might do here in our own community. And so I'll go ahead and move on into this that as we saw in the movie, what the filmmakers do is that they provide a commodity chain analysis for plastics, which is to say, you know, that they're taking a holistic view of plastics and looking at its environmental impacts from the point of extraction of natural resources to the manufacture, to the use and, you know, the, the disposal of plastics materials. And so they, you know, start us right at the beginning to make that link with fossil fuels. The plastics are, of course, mostly made from fossil fuels. And there are a lot of impacts here. I actually grew up in Wyoming, which is a state that is, you know, really highly dependent economically upon fossil fuel extraction. And when I was growing up, I saw lots of images like this one of sort of majestic uh, sunset images 
of oil rigs and oil wells. Before I became a sociologist, I actually worked for an environmental organization as a community organizer. The organization was called Biodiversity Conservation Alliance. And we worked to protect wildlands and threatened and endangered species on public lands from oil and gas exploration. And so I can tell you that the, you know, as we all know here in this audience, those environmental impacts of oil and gas production, really just extraction is a better word, are real. But then of course, in terms of the plastic commodity chain, we move on to, to the production of plastics from fossil fuels, taking those fossil fuel molecules and transforming them, processing them, refining them into plastics. And this is a highly intensive process. It is a process that produces toxic pollution, toxic emissions that are released into the environment. And there are important environmental justice uh, relationships here that we know that, uh, you know, Black and brown communities are more likely to be located next to these, these manufacturing facilities that produce plastics. Low income neighborhoods are also more likely to be located next to these, next to these uh, manufacturing plants. So that's something to be aware of and that we can keep on thinking about our environmental justice implications of the plastic commodity chain as we move forward uh, this evening. And then of course, right, I mean, of course we, we, have the other, <laughs> we, we have the other step in terms of plastics are used for you know, all kinds of purposes, but including just, just to hold the things that we consume, you know, just for packaging. And so after we consume these goods and we have the plastics and we dispose of them and the vast majority of it we learned in the film are just thrown in the landfill a lot of plastics are manufactured in such a way that they cannot be recycled. They are manufactured, right? And they, they're put together in different kinds of layers. They're, so they're manufactured in such a way that they cannot be recycled. So they end up in the landfill or they end up as litter in the ocean or maybe it's along the, you know, in the Rappahannock River and folks that do Friends of the Rappahannock cleanups can attest to this, the gross amount of plastic that winds up in our own river, as well as those, those images that we saw of, you know, from the Philippines or out, out in the oceans in the movie. I was stunned myself by that statement in the film about how we are on track to reach a point in the not too distant future where the amount of plastic trash in the ocean will be equivalent to the amount of fish in the ocean. And so, I mean, I need to look at that. Is that real? Is that a real thing? And so it's based on a report that came out in 2016 uh, by a, a scientific organization. And there is some debate about this. You know, it's, it's I saw, you know, it sort of depends upon what estimates we use about the amount of fish in the ocean. It depends upon what estimates we use about the amount of, of plastic waste that ends up in the ocean. But to me, it's, it's mind boggling to think that this is even something that we, that is plausible, that we really have to consider and that we really have to study, that this could somehow happen, that this much plastic trash could end up in the ocean that becomes equivalent with all, all fish life that's there. Well, you know, beyond ending up in landfills or litter, we of course, another route that our plastic trash in the world goes is, is, is incineration. It ends up being burned. And sometimes it's, right, it's just burned as, as waste. Sometimes it's burned as a kind of waste to energy um, to, to produce electricity as well. Proponents of this method of disposal will say that it is by and large safe. They'll say that there, there is, you know, scrubbers and, uh, you know, precautions used in these plants to prevent pollution. But 
No incineration is completely safe. It inherently and necessarily produces toxic materials, some of which end up in the air we breathe, some of which end up in our waterways. We also have recycling. And I do, I mean, a lot of ways in America, we talk about this is, right? I mean, this is what we hope will happen. This is what we hope will happen with our plastic waste. But of course, even the, the EPA, the US EPA says that in 2016, most plastic waste is not recycled in the United States. Less than 10% of plastic waste in the United States is actually recycled. Of that material that is recycled, sadly, as we saw, a great deal of it goes overseas. It was once mostly the, the great proportion of that waste that, you know, those, I should say those plastic recyclable materials uh, were sent to China. China is no, it says no, no longer, we know we have our own plastic materials to deal with, our own plastic waste to deal with. And so uh, now it's, it goes to assortment array of, of different countries around the world. And that is in itself, that is a real environmental justice kind of issue and a global scale to think about how we in this nation have all of this waste and recyclable materials that we don't necessarily know what to do with. And so we ship it abroad to nations that are really, as we saw in the film, struggling, struggling to deal just with their own plastic waste. So something that I have heard from folks is that this is, is maybe a depressing movie. Um, I, think that that's, I think that that's kind of an interesting reaction. I mean, I, I absolutely, this, it is a depressing reality, I suppose. Um, it is an eye-opening film, but I hope that that's not the, the ultimate message that you received from this film. Um, I think it just depends upon the framework we have when we watch it. I think that that, are we depressed or not? It depends upon the framework or, you know, our perspective that we have when we watch it. And also, you know, we want to, to me, it's an even more depressing reality to think about major environmental problems that are happening in the world that I'm not aware of. So for that reason, I'm, I'm grateful for the film, but we, let's talk about that. We'll move on, we'll move on and we'll talk about that. I think that it is, it would be depressing way to watch the film to think about it as an individual because as individuals, there's only so much we can do. I, um, I try to take efforts to minimize my use of plastics and I'm sure that most people on, you know, in, here that are part of the discussion have even more heroic efforts to limit their plastic use. And we should feel good about that, by the way. And we should feel good about all the steps that the co-op is, is taking to reduce their use of plastics. You know, we, sh we should take time to, to feel good about that. But at the same time, we know from this film, we know it's not enough, right? It's not enough. And so if we just look at it that way, if we stop right there, that is depressing because we feel helpless. We feel helpless as individuals because our individual practices as consumers isn't enough. But that's why we can't stop there. That's why we can't stop there. And that's why it's helpful to know that we're not just individuals. We're not just individuals because you know, we are, for, for one, we're all connected here to, today. We're all connected here together as part of this co-op that's bringing us together to talk about important environmental issues like plastics pollution and the plastics commodity chain, right? We're not just individuals, we're linked together. We're organized together. And I am seeing here in Fredericksburg that the environmental community is getting more and more organized. We are working together more and more and more 
And we're beginning to do things together and to make things happen, push things forward in a very hopeful fashion. And that to me is when, when we look at this film, when we view the film, film from this framework through an awareness that we're not just individuals, that we're increasingly organized and that there are people, you know, incredibly smart people working on this issue all around the world, not just in our community, not just in the United States, but in India, in the European Union, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, then we say, oh, we're, you know, in Africa, we can be part of a global movement that's working to tackle this problem. And that, from that perspective, it's, it's an eye-opening film because it tells us about the crisis. It tells us about you know, the, this immense challenge that we face. But it, it also says, look at all the people working on this. We can do something about it too. And I think one helpful analogy for me, from my perspective is Fossil Free Fredericksburg, which because you know, myself is somebody who's long been concerned about climate change and sought to be involved in different ways. And it's like, well, sure, you know, as an individual, I can do things. I try to ride my bike all around the community as much as possible, but I know ultimately that doesn't really make a dent in our total carbon emissions. And I can encourage other people to try to ride their bikes more, but I know that our whole society is built around fossil fuels. So it's ultimately not gonna really make a difference. But I became excited when I saw, you know, all around the country, different cities were saying, we are gonna commit to a future without fossil fuels. And right, we're gonna to commit to it and we're gonna find ways to make it happen. And so when I saw that, I sort of thought, look, we can do that in, in Fredericksburg too. And that would be a powerful thing because it's not just as individuals, it's working as a community to mobilize our community for change. And so we you know, were able to uh, you know, work with other folks in the Clean and Green Commission and elsewhere in Fredericksburg and the Sierra Club to encourage our city council to make that commitment to transition away from fossil fuels. But we're not stopping there, right? That's a commitment and that's really helpful. I, I think about uh, the poem by uh, Theodore Roque that's, uh, you know, I wake to sleep. If you're all familiar with that poem where, where he says, I learn, by, I, I learn by going where I have to go. I think that that's kind of where we're at in terms of our environmental crisis. We don't exactly know all the steps that we'll take in the transition to 100% renewable energy, but we know that that's our end goal. So let's learn, let's find out how we do it, right? We know the destination, let's learn as we go. And that's what we're doing in Fossil Free Fredericksburg and elsewhere in the environmental community where we've identified like one thing that Fredericksburg needs is a sustainability manager. And so we've you know, encouraged our city council to budget for that. And that's in the budget right now. And the city council's meeting on that budget, <laughs> um, actually they, they met yesterday uh, and they're, they're in the process to make that happen. And we know that this, you know, the school district needs to have solar panels. And we know that we need a climate plan for the city. And so it's, you know, we're sort of saying step by step, we're gonna make it happen. And we're gonna be organized together to make it happen, to keep on pushing. And that's kind of, to me, that's an analogy of what we might do in Fredericksburg about plastic pollution, is to say, let's, let's commit to an ambitious goal. Um, let's find out you know, what, how we might commit ourselves or what a goal might be in terms of plastic pollution. And let's, organize ourselves and begin to, to move ourselves to meet it. Well, I mean, there's already some positive things happening in the state of Virginia that I'm sure you know, many of you, like I said, are, are already aware of that just this past session in the General Assembly, 
there was a law that was, that was passed to move us away from polystyrene or styrofoam food materials. I mean, that's great, right? I mean, this stuff is, is horrible in our environment. And so this is important stuff. Unfortunately, you know, it's not gonna go into effect for, I think, ultimately for smaller businesses, which was where we really need it to go into effect until 2025. But at least we have that ban in place and we can work to educate when we, you know, see any businesses that might be still putting food in, in styrofoam containers, we can educate them uh, about this and about the, the ban that's gonna happen. So, I mean, that's, that's something positive that is already in place here in, in Fredericksburg. And the General Assembly also in the last session passed some legislation that will allow localities to pass a, or to implement a plastic bag tax that basically says that grocery stores or drug stores can charge or, or will have to charge five, per, five cents per bag given out to customers when they ring up their products. And some of this money will go back towards environmental education. And this is something that Fredericksburg now has the freedom to implement. And the Clean and Green Commission and George Sully are working to advocate for this, for Fredericksburg implementing this plastic bag tax right now. And so that's something that we know that we could, we could all get on board to support. Many states, well, I, I don't know about many, but some states at least are, are working to, you know, just ban, outright ban plastic bags. And to me, that's, that's an exciting thing. That would be a helpful thing. So we see, you know, California, um, Oregon, Washington, New York, um, you know, already have passed plastic bag bans. And just to see in the movie how many nations have banned plastic bags was really inspiring to me. You know, nations that we wouldn't necessarily expect, like in, in Africa. Um, Fredericksburg can't do this alone because, you know, just be, basically because Virginia is a, a Dillon rule state that says that cities don't have the authority to do this. But I have absolutely no doubt that people in Virginia are already working to build support for a, for a plastic bag ban. And that is something that we hear and Fredericksburg could, you know, could, could work to join. We could, we could organize ourselves, we could mobilize ourselves to advocate for, you know, that kind of legislation and as, as state legislation ourselves. And I mean, it, it, it is amazing to see how, how many new possibilities we're starting to have in Virginia when it comes to environmental legislation. So, a few years ago, that would not be a possibility. Increasingly, maybe so, right? If enough people organize to make it happen. Then we saw in, in the film about different cities committing to a zero waste approach, which sets a goal. So I think that that's important because like the, you know, committing to the transition to 100% renewable energy, it doesn't say, this has to happen overnight because that's unrealistic. But it says, you know, let's, let's commit to an approach that's a continuous effort to phase out waste, not by burning it or landfill, um, but by creating a system change that works to prevent the waste in the first place. So that to me is a hopeful approach that's, you know, many nations or may, sorry, many cities in Europe have implemented, so many cities in the United States have implemented, but also, right, in, in Asia too. And it is not itself a panacea, uh, or panacea, sorry, <laughs> a panacea, um, because there are larger problems with just the manufacture of plastic themselves that sort of requires that 
this waste be disposed of. But at least this approach on a local level works to expose this fact. It works to say that a lot of the problems come in the plastics commodity chain. And ultimately, you know, we'll need to work as a nation to put in place producer uh, extended responsibility to say that manufacturers of products need to have a plan in place and need to you know, either make their materials fully recyclable or compostable, or else they need to, to pay in order to allow you know, communities to have the funds to di properly dispose of it. So this is a movement, again, that is, is gaining traction in Europe and that we could begin to move forward with. You know, we could begin thinking about it here in Fredericksburg, knowing that we can't make this change ourselves, but this is a, a global effort. Thinking too about the plastics commodity chain and about, you know, the original source of plastics is from, from fossil fuels. And so there's already a powerful climate movement in the United States that's working to keep fossil fuels in the ground and to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies that, that make plastics artificially cheap. I mean, they make all of our use of fossil fuels artificially cheap. And so that's, you know, that's something that's, that could become more and more possible as more and more communities become aware of these issues and are organizing around these issues. So, you know, Fredericksburg um, is, is a community more and more and more organized. And, you know, we, for instance, in the environmental community, meet up in, uh, in, in sessions that are organized by Paula Chow and they were organized by other folks before her and she'll pass on the torch next month. Uh, but we meet every, or maybe six months, but we meet every month as an environmental community, somebody from fossil fuel or fossil free Fredericksburg and somebody from the Clean and Green Commission and uh, folks from the Sierra Club and folks from the Friends of the Rappahannock or, you know, and all different kinds of environmental organizations meet to coordinate every month and to talk about how, how we can share information, how we can share resources, how we can push our effort forward. And we're getting more and more organized but it seems like you know there is there is a gap there, and that there isn't an organization that's really focused on that issue of plastics and zero waste. I mean, maybe that's something that that we could fill, right? Um, certainly, the Sierra Club has has done some important work in this regard with the Pass on Plastics effort. But is there? a more intentional effort that we could take specifically on this issue that might also work on composting, creating residential composting here in Fredericksburg, which is something that you know, exists in many communities we could make happen that's not really linked to uh, plastics themselves, right? But it is linked to this overall issue of, of what do we do with waste in landfills? So, so there's a gap here that you know, maybe, maybe some of us are, are called to fill, maybe you, right? Maybe, maybe you might want to be part of an effort uh, to fill that gap and to be working on zero waste and plastics pollution here in Fredericksburg. Well, originally, because this is, you know, is a discussion about the film, I wanted everybody to have a chance to talk about the film and to share your perspective, share your thoughts about the film and what you think might be done. Unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to do individual breakout sessions, but I don't think that we're you know, such a large group that we can't you know, maybe speak um, as a whole. You know, it's just we can speak to each other. I don't think we're that, that large. So anyway, I'll, I can kind of pass it over uh, to Gerald 
who might be able to sort of facilitate that, or maybe folks might just want to speak about one. What did you think about the film? What are your thoughts about what we what can be done? Um, so anyway, what do you all think? I saw that there were also some chats, chat questions and comments coming in too. Just, just, just one or, or one question that's for me. Uh, it seems to me that the, the biggest problem is getting the broad population to understand there is a problem and educate them on the possible actions that they can take personally. How do we improve on getting the word out and getting people to be concerned and do the right thing? I mean, I think everybody here in this group probably already does most of the right thing. It's a question of how do we get the other 99% of the people to do the right thing. You know, I'm in, you know, I might also say let's, we can educate folks, but also we need to, we need to think about how do we talk about policy? How do we talk about government policy and shift the responsibility, not just to individuals, but to governments and to companies that are ultimately producing this waste. Um, I think that that's where we'll have, just like with the efforts to tackle climate change, that's where we'll have the most success. Because again, it, we can try as mightily as we want as individuals, but there's only so much we can do um, in a whole, whole economy that's geared around plastics. So I think we you know, certainly should be educating folks and talking about what they can do in regards to plastics. But in, ultimately, in order to tackle this problem, we need to shift the conversation also to think about public policy and you know, politics. I mean, do you, do you, do you think that uh, we have to regulate the, the people to get this done? Is that what you're trying to say in terms of policy? Ultimately, yeah, right, absolutely, absolutely. And, and this has been you know, something that we saw in the film that was, is done in Europe to say, um, you know, thinking about that idea of, of producer extended responsibility and in some ways just to straight up outlaw certain kinds of uses of, of single use plastic. Right. To have a, you know, a ban on plastic bags. Um, can I make, and, can and I make the European a, Union is, is taking that, taking yeah. that ban further. Can I make a suggestion? Could we go to gallery view and get rid of the share screen so we can see everyone discussion? Thank I you. I like that. I like that. Let's do that. All right. So Helen has said, on here, I think too much emphasis is being placed on recycling and not reducing and reusing. I would, I would have to agree with her. And I think it's because everybody would rather just throw it into their single stream recycling and forget about it. They don't, <laughs> it makes it much easier for them than doing anything else, right? Um, Elza said for there to change policies, we need people to speak up to their representatives. I'm sure you can. That is you can... Based, Eric, that is based on what you just said. We need to change policy, and I totally agree with you. Um, but that doesn't happen until enough people um, force their representatives to address that issue. Absolutely, absolutely. And so that's why I I wonder if it would be helpful to think about, you know, is there are folks interested? in you know, working on these kinds of issues, or maybe the co-op is itself um, to sort of, you know, or maybe maybe some you know, group here or other, other folks in Fredericksburg, but I think you know, meeting as a group and, I, I, and finding ways to move this, move this debate into both educating consumers, educating individuals, educating families, but also you know, shifting it to talk about, you know, how do we get, how, you know, how do we communicate with our lawmakers and our leaders? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, our, our, our food co-op has a sustainability advisory committee. It's already established, you know, start meeting next month. And it's principally to make sure that the 
the grocery store gets greener and greener over time. In other words, we'll keep looking for solutions to existing waste problems, et cetera, uh, supply problems, uh, whether the, the people we're getting things from are as sustainable as possible. So that's one, but you know, we, we feel like we're sort of restricted to working just with the food co-op because obviously we are a, a uh, profit-making organization and, and uh, we're not a political organization. But I think, I think there should be enough people within the community to, to set up something similar to what we're doing. I mean, we'll be looking at getting renewable energy credits for the food co-op and, and looking for ways to minimize plastic, to minimize food waste and minimize packaging waste and all that good stuff. So it shouldn't be, I mean, it should be something common to quite a few industries within Fredericksburg, so. Mm -hmm. I Actually, suggest you, in, Eric. Do you oh, have, go ahead. Go ahead, Rich. Sorry. Um, sorry, you had a couple of questions you were going to ask in discussion groups. Do you want to throw those out and see um, who in the audience would want to, um, you know, uh, give their reactions? Definitely. That would be wonderful. Wonderful. I mean, just the the discussion questions were. One, what did you think about the film? It would be great just to have a conversation about that. What are, what did you like or dislike? Um, what, you know, any criticism, anything that you thought was helpful or inspiring? And then also, you know, from there we can then move on to what do we do about this crisis? All right. So Paula has asked, has said something here, she said, uh, I'm not quite sure what she's referring to. I guess she's referring to some legal, uh, from some law that was in, passed by the state. A good example is SB 1164, Advanced Recycling, signed into law March 29th. The, the scam that was traded for the polystyrene ban. Okay, we need to be aware it could sneak into our area just as the bill sneaked into becoming law. Yes, we have to be very vigilant as to what gets into these laws. Wouldn't you say? Eric, uh, may, you know. may I speak? Um, sure, go ahead, Paula. May I speak to that? Yeah. Um, th this advanced recycling is um, put into um, law by lobbying from the uh, oil and gas corporations. And interestingly, it was a bipartisan um, bill that became law. That became law because it was traded for the polystyrene. Polystyrene. Um, you need two, at least two or three consecutive years to get into committee and get into the, um, in, in to pass. So the, the deal was that they would pass the polystyrene ban in trade for having this advanced recycling. And this is a scam of, it's an incinerator essentially, just as Eric's slide showed the um, plastic burning this is what it is. Now, the caution that I want to make is because this just snuck in and we, none of us could really tackle it um, by the time it went into committee um, during the session. So remember a few years back that um, the R board and Stafford, as well as uh, Fredericksburg, wanted to put in an incinerator at Eskimo Hill. That was a big deal, and Sierra Club worked real hard to try to shut that down. Um, so my concern is that that's going to surface again, and the people in Stafford who were pushing that, and there were a lot of pro-incinerator folks in Fredericksburg, um, on government side, as well as in Stafford. So I think we need to be very careful about um, how this could sneak in again. And um, I'm not sure if folks know that the, the pollutants that an incinerator of plastic would um, leak out into the air is tremendous, tremendous chemicals. So um, that that's how it's, Things just happen and it's really hard to stay on top of all of these issues. But this one I think is a potential for our area. I'm done. 
Thank you, Paula. I and I think you know, Paula, the information that I'd seen that had come from you and that had come from the Sierra Club was already doing a great job of of linking this with environmental justice too, pointing out that where these facilities might be located is most likely not in you know um, wealthier or wider areas in Virginia. That it's more uh -huh. likely that they're going to end up in in you know poor folks neighborhoods and the neighborhoods of people of color. So I, th I really appreciate that from the Sierra Club, seeing that, that already that link was being made because it's, it's, I'm sure will be a reality if these things come to pass. Something that I'd like to say is that for anyone who has not watched the movie, uh, I figured I pretty much knew it all until I watched the movie, uh, including my partner who watched the movie and watched the whole hour and a half and I thought if he can sit through it I can so I really recommend because you learn a lot um, including some of the solutions down the line um, and basically it's keeping the large companies accountable and responsible I agree else I think one of the biggest things for me, and I, I feel like I had a handle on what was going on. And after watching the movie, uh, I watched it myself the first time and with my family the second time. And uh, the, the part that I wasn't mindful of is the beginning and the end. And one of the statements that the movie uh, uh, contains is, is the, the fact that the problem ends up in the East and in Indonesia and um, the Philippines and uh, yep. India, and it starts in the West. And I feel like, uh, like, like these poor people living right next to these plants uh, have experienced tremendous health issues over the last 10 years they one of them made a comment these exxon mobil and chevron and dow they need to be handed the bill and i feel like this is that's a a reasonable place to start you know there were excerpts from their um their conventions at exxon mobil how they stand to to double their billions well, why can't they help these people that end up with what they're manufacturing? Uh, you know, and the blame of individual communities that we're not doing it right, that we, we don't have the, uh, we're not recycling enough, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. And the blame is certainly placed on the very people that should be the last. So that was my perspective on the movie. It was very dismal. And, and yeah, we can do all of these things in our community, but we're up against these giants. Is that going to make a difference? And then not to mention the political venue that you have to go through to hopefully try to get to their, um, you know, to where it begins. It, it's, it just seems very dismal. But I appreciate Eric, your um, your glimmer of hope and and your um, sociology perspective on things because we do need to not be depressed about this. And I mean, I can tell you, I I didn't sleep very well for the one or two nights after we watched this movie. So I really appreciate you discussing this with us. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much for, you know, for having me here. And, and we are up against giants, but, and I don't, you know, I, I don't think I'm being naive or, you know, just unrealistically optimistic when I, I am hopeful when I think that we're potentially at a transformative time where we have the capacity to make some big changes. I think we're already starting to see that. It's just, will we seize these opportunities? And also just the awareness that even though we're up against giants, we're not alone in that. I mean, because it truly is a global effort to push back against these these manufacturers. Thank you. All right, a couple more comments here. Marcia Keener has written, 
The breathtaking fossil fuel subsidies were the most interesting to me, along with the externalizing of the true life cycle costs of generating plastic, overall misdirection of the public, and development of new markets for unrecyclable packaging. Yes, incineration is not the answer. Thank you, Sierra Club. I, 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 I grew up in the chemical industry, so I understand all the stuff that the chemical industry has tried to get away with for its entire lifetime and is still getting away with. Uh, it's a matter of making sure that the EPA dilutes their regulations as far as pollution so that they can stay economical. Um, that's principally the, the, the reason these things are the way they are. Right? That's why you don't get 99% of the mercury out. You only get 50% of the mercury out. Because if they wanted to take 99% out, their products would be uh, uneconomical compared to those from overseas. So that's, that's what happens. So. It's going to take some doing on the part of all the individuals in the United States to understand what the chemical industry is doing to get away with what they do and put a stop to it. It's going to be hard, but I think I think if you get enough people behind it, it can be done. Right. All right. Let's see what else we have here. Carol Carlson has said yes. We need to pressure our elected officials to move to circular society. EPR is a good idea and also shifting away from fossil fuel product production. Thank you to the co-op for providing a place to start discussions and educate people. Well, thank you, Carol. We'll, we'll, we, we certainly hope to educate everybody on, on uh, a lot of uh, pollution prevention and recycling and reuse and all that good stuff at the, the co-op. All right. Rich has said to- There's another one, Marcia Keener, right above it. Yeah, I already, I already said that one. Sorry. She talked about the, the amount of money that's going to the fossil fuel no. industry, subsidizing them. Yep. Mm, yep. And then they're not, uh, you know, they're, 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 not, they're not taking the responsibility for all their ways. They say that's up to the people at the other end, not them, so, all right. Rich LaRochelle said, to me, a key conclusion from the movie is that change on the scale required will take governments globally working together to create change. I can agree with that. Ruth Landry Stone, I found the movie disturbing yet inspiring. Each of us has an individual responsibility, but change can occur, especially if we work together. Right. They're coming fast and furious now. All right, uh, Rich again has said, making changes in our individual habits is important and it also is a way of each of us walking the talk. I agree with, certainly agree with that. Paul the child, the corporations know how to market. They have a recyclable or greener product or contribute to some environmental cause. So the general public say, great, they are doing something right. So the corporations get away with murder literally. I can. I can go along with what Paul has said because that's exactly how they 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 do their thing. I mean, they they have this great big uh, committee together to look at plastics recycling. Now, all Coca Cola and everybody else has put together this committee. But if they don't capture the the plastics in the first place, it doesn't matter what type of recycling technology they have. If it's all just thrown out in the, in the scattered in the in the uh, environment. They could have the best recycling technology around and would never be used. So, all right. And, Any, and maybe on that point, you know, I might add too that there's an interesting history that was shared in the movie about how in the, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, there, there was more and more waste that was being generated by Americans. And there was this problem of litter and some states were, re, they were, I think Vermont, namely, um, was requiring that Coca-Cola and you know other other um, manufacturers use reusable bottles, right? and that was actually that was actually law. And mm. you know the the beverage industry worked to create the Keep America Beautiful campaign that was like that sort of shifted the burden. Said it's not our fault if some people are irresponsible in litter. What we need to do is we just need to end litter and make sure that trash ends up in the right place. And so it, it sort of masterfully 
you know, they've been doing, they're <laughs> very smart and have been doing this public relations work for some time that shifted the burden away from them as the producer and said, it's, it's everybody, it's an individual's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways that, that framing has still stayed with us. And so absolutely we all have our part to play in terms of personally, you know, uh, walking the walk and, you know, being good about not using single use plastics. Um, but it is, is definitely, you know, really helpful as we're doing right now to have this conversation about that producer responsibility. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see, a couple more here. I will, it's 6.53, we got a few more minutes. Carol Carlson has said, Fredericksburg League of Women Voters is looking into the impact of plastic bags and into advocating for plastic bag tax in Fredericksburg. I think that's a good thing. Marsha Keena, Keener, as far as expertise on staff, the offending companies seem to be the top to be top heavy and reliant on PR people and missing the chemical engineers and people of environmental economic long-term wisdom to actually help build a circular economy. If people and governments come and stick together, there will be no place to hide this ecocidal sham. And finally, Ruth Landry Stone, per the movie, recycling is not the answer. It's the prevention of the problem. Stop and turn off the tap. All good comments. I would think that we, we probably will have a plastic bag tax in Fredericksburg for pretty soon, won't we, Eric? You don't, don't you think so? I mean, I think I think so. I think that it's I know that it's that it's in the works. Um, that you know, George Soley at the Clean Green Commission, and and I don't want to put Christy Carver on the spot, but you <laughs> might you might have some news about that on the Clean Green Commission. I don't I, if it's been discussed. As far as what, Christy? I'm sorry, I was writing and I missed the question. What oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize because I even said I didn't mean to put you on the spot, and I totally put you on the spot. But we we're just wondering about. You know, if the uh, plastic bag tax has been discussed much at the Clean and Green. Well, we uh, yeah, we sent it to City Council and said, please consider this and and the you know started at the next cycle, um, which still would, is a little time off. George is really um, take you know moving this forward, but we we have said please do this. It would be a big help. And then, so another step would be Stafford County and Spotsylvania County. And although, right, it's a very different political climate and much less likely, I think that that's also how, you know, ch change, it, it might take a lot longer, but also bigger changes can be made when we start organizing around these things. If, if we find that's not possible, then, you know, maybe it gives voters more incentive to, to replace certain elected officials. Yeah, that, that was what I was writing, that um, I'm encouraged by the laws that Virginia legislature passed this session, that there, there was some focus on environmental things. It's small, but there are steps, which is new. And also the federal government has a focus on climate now. So I, we just have to keep electing people that this is a priority and we need, we need some new people, even, even in our own city and, you know, further up, but. I'm encouraged by that. All right, we got a few more here. Rich has said, Fredericksburg can be a model for the surrounding communities. And I, I certainly totally agree with that. I hope we are a, a model for the surrounding communities. Paula Chow, I agree with Eric. How do we begin to organize solidly to take on policy and legislation? We don't have time to dilly-dally. We need big change I, I, now, probably, as she's wanting to say. And Ruth has said, I like the sign on the co-op front door reminding people to bring their reusable bag into the store. I like that too. And finally, uh, Rich says, thanks for Christy and the Clean and Green Commission. I thank you too. You guys are doing a great job and keep up the good work down there. All right, getting close to seven o'clock here. Is there any other person who wants to speak out? Uh, Oh, let me I, hold on here. Andy has said, I still don't understand the value of a plastic bag tax. All it does is pass on extra expense along to the customer. 
a total ban is all that will work. And Adam Schwartz says, I hope we do our best not to make this partisan. Everyone has a concern about the environment. Mm -hmm. And Christy Carver has gone on to say, this has been a great discussion, educational and inspiring. Thank you to the food co-op and to Eric. Thank you for being here and sending your uh, information about the bag tax. Eric says, let me know if you'd like to continue this conversation at ebonds at umw.edu. So that's a, a good place to sort of end it, I think. We're at 658. Andrew, uh, we didn't get to your question here. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to print out all of these for Eric and myself, and we can try to get back to some of these questions that haven't been answered. I'm trying to copy and paste as we as we speak here. Not easy easy to do. But anyway, Eric, I wanted to thank you. And I wanted to thank everybody who came here to participate in this. I think it's a great start. Like uh, everybody has said, I think we need a, a group that really, really uh, wants to do something about this and, and works hard and diligently to do it. It's, it's gonna take a lot of effort uh, obviously, legislation takes a lot of effort. Trying to get people educated on what to do takes a lot of effort. Trying to get the individual uh, businesses to do something outside, you know, they don't need legislation to stop giving plastic bags out. I mean, they can do it on their own accord if they really want to. If, it, if the people that shop there really want it, then, they, then they, they'll do it, I think, so. Again, I want to thank everybody. I certainly want everybody to uh, think about this. And, and when Eric starts this new group, we, everybody's going to volunteer to be on it. <laughs> and we'll make all kinds of progress. And I certainly want everybody to shop at the new food co-op. And we, we will try to keep it as green and make it greener from, um, on a day-by-day -day basis. So thank you. Thank you all. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks, Eric. Great job. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric.